to uh, get things started. This is the premiere of Witness at Tornillo in Tampa. And I wanted to get, uh, Josh, your reflections on seeing this documentary now with uh, the kind of that we're living in. Well, the first thing I want to say is that this is the first time I've seen it with Spanish subtitles, and I'm so happy about that. So is my mom. <laughs> it, 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 it's just great to see it that way. Um, this is a beautiful theater. Uh, this is kind of the end of uh, our, our squeak through Florida. We've had a, a few screenings here. And it's, uh, it's good to meet people that are, uh, that are so concerned about this. It's, it heartens me, and I need to be one of them. I need, I need, I need your strength. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is go to the border. We're going to be witnessing at uh, the ground floor of the borders. We're going to take this idea of witnessing, <laughs> and we're going to go where they're hiding the people now. And where they're hiding them is across the bridges on the other side of the wall. And where they're being hidden, they're, um, they're being kidnapped, they're being attacked, they're being raped, um, they're being killed. And so it's our, 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 our greatest battle yet. It's, it's what we have to do now. So when I see the film, I, 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 I look and I see that we had what appears to be some success at places like uh, at Tornillo, and I don't know if you, you realize the end of the film, and it's way before it, but the homestead did close. It took a lot longer. Um, and there are far fewer people in, uh, uh, far fewer unaccompanied minors in custody now than there were when we started this. Um, which again, sounds like good news, but it's, it's, there are bad reasons for this good news. And the bad reasons are that it's now on the other side of the border where they're hiding it from us. So, that's what our eyes are for. That's what witnessing is for. Uh, those are my thoughts. What keeps you going? What keeps you involved in this fight, Josh? I'll tell you what it isn't. It isn't uh, hope. It's, it's something that comes from uh, a little further down than hope. I, I don't know if this is going to work. I just know that I can't stop doing it. And, um, it's, it's, you know, I'm not that comfortable talking like this, but it's more like love. Um, it's something that you just feel uh, organically you must do. So what keeps me going, uh, I, I take strength from, from, from other people. I take strength from my wife, Melissa. I, I take strength from all the people that get involved, but if I had to, rely on hope, I would, I would have given up a long time ago, crawling into that RV every night. So I, I, don't, I don't rely on that. We will have to find a place for when we get the, uh, get what we need to do this work. All of us need it. Thank you, thank you. And Pamela and Norman, welcome. If I could have each of you tell us the organization that you're with and also the work that it does, please. Such a pleasure to be here with everyone and thank you so much for to Josh um, and everybody who has also along with us been doing this work. Um, the Florida Immigrant Coalition is um, an alliance of over 60 um, organizations that include faith, farm workers, student unions, you name it. And we meet at the intersection of everything that's immigrant justice work. Um, here in the state of Florida with Alliance Nation um, nationally. Um, SIC has been doing um, um, a lot of immigrant justice work for over two decades. And we've fought campaigns like CCA Go, um, Go Away that also in South Florida stopped the, um, the creation of a detention center. Um, and we also fight policies that we know pipeline immigrants more into um, mass detention and mass incarceration. Um, we stopped um, anti-immigrant. We stopped um, many anti-immigrant laws in the state from from passing. Um, most recently, we 
We also mobilized in Tallahassee to stop one of the harshest anti-immigrant bills that would pack my more and more community members into detention, um, SB 168. And unfortunately, that bill has passed. So we, in our work, um, we try to create similarly the witnessing and the visibility of the broader system and inequalities. And we want to uh, address root causes, root causes of why people uh, involuntarily migrate, um, are forced to migrate, and get shed light to that history, right? We know that there's a long history of violence in this country. We know that we're a nation that was founded on indigenous genocide, and indigenous children were separated from their families. We also know that this nation was founded on slavery, and that meant that um, children were treated like property and separated from their parents. We know that this new wave of violence is not new, it's been here, and to us is through our work creating more of that um, education and, and then hitting the streets and doing every form of action that we can take. But more recently we have been focused on the broad education piece through our popular education and going into communities um, so folks understand that we all have a, a, a role to play. We all have a role to play in this work, and, and, and that work looks very different for many of us, um, but we all, we, we all have a role to play. And so we have a hotline that we'll share, we have fires outside, and, and we look forward to, to continue to, to try to do this work together because it, it does take all of us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm with the Council on American Islamic Relations, and we're primarily a civil rights and immigrant rights um, organization. Um, with our offices in Tampa, South Florida, um, the Panhandle, and Fort Myers. And uh, primarily we're focused on, on civil rights, so we do employment discrimination for, you know, for anyone who, who seeks our help. We do also asylum law and help families with family immigration matters. And, uh, we have a, a communications department that basically um, seeks to um, educate about Islam and, and, and how it obviously fits into, into the United States society and also to empower the Muslim community, particularly the Muslim immigrant community, uh, to participate in the political process. We have a government affairs department with actually army funding. So we maintain um, relationships with our legislative and government officials and try to influence policy that, you know, on behalf of um, you know, the Muslim community, but also the immigrant community. Uh, generally. Um, we uh, advocate for uh, victims' rights. Uh, we work with the FBI, for example, to help victims of, this, of, of uh, hate crimes. Uh, we've trained um, many um, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, for example, uh, to how to deal with the Muslim community. And on um, immigrants' rights, um, issue we also uh, educate, we try to educate the public and that's one thing that actually the uh, council has enabled me to do is do a lot of research on the, on the um, um, interplay of the prison industrial complex and the immigrant rights, uh, the, the immigration detention that's going on and, and uh, it's really stunning when you hear about the minimum quotas of immigrants that have to be in jail at uh, at any particular time in order to make sure the profits are being made. And uh, the two ladies that came out to meet you that said, I know we really believe that if Americans knew more about what is going on, and this is why I think this movie and what you're doing and, and, the, and you coming to this event and uh, being hosted here by this organization is so important. Because I do believe that if more Americans knew what is really behind this hatred on immigrants, the language that is being used, that is curated very carefully uh, in order to dehumanize um, a, a whole segment of the population. This is not only an attack on immigrants coming into the border, but particularly also the ones that are already here, who were made criminals by the system. You know, and then we're calling people, you know, Ill illegal criminals and all. And I think it's so important that we get the message out that uh, first of all, being unlawfully present in the United States is not a crime. I mean, I, I go around and give presentations on that. I always hear the audience gasp because that's not what we're being told. We're being told a bill of goods and that basically we have people in this country that were migrants for generations and now all of a sudden we're criminalizing their contacts, uh, their uh, conduct.
and calling them criminals. And then basically going down this whole rosy path of this is a threat and crime and whatnot. And, and also what I've done recently is research on how this played out in the history of immigration law. I mean, I'm an immigration lawyer. Basically, we did the same thing to the Chinese. Uh, rapists and murderers, it was the exact same language that was being used. We had ethnic um, quotas coming into the country, so the, the racist nature behind the immigration policy, is it, it cannot be refuted by anyone who actually takes a look at this. And we need to continue to have conversations because in these sound bites, in these ads that people run uh, to scare the population into, into backing policies that are just inhumane and morally wrong. Uh, yes, it's the law. That's what I hear all the time. Oh, we know it's the law. So we're following the law. Well, you know, I'm from Germany. There's a whole history of people who followed the law in the 1930s and did moral, uh, morally outrageous acts in the name of the law. And I think we need to continue this conversation. And thank you so much, Josh, for what you're doing. I think this, this has really opened a lot of eyes. And, uh, Thank you, thank you. Before, before we open it up to questions, if I could ask each of you, if you could give us two or three things that we can do in this work to, to assist so that in 2020, which we know is a very popular, it's, it's an election season, what can we do, two or three things that we can do to help in this effort? Definitely bring it to every platform that you're in. Um, we know politics is going to take us everywhere. Okay. Um, this is um, a very important year um, in shifting the narratives and holding every um, person that's running for political office accountable. Um, we saw in the documentary that a lot of um, political figures made it to these detention centers. And a, we understand that when they're there, um, it puts uh, another eye to the problem. So it's important that we're pushing candidates um, to continue a, to, do, to do that. Another thing is we need to understand that this is something that happens at a local level as well. Um, we, as I said, this year we have one of the worst anti-immigrant um, laws in the country, which was SB 168. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Flake, and many other um, civil rights groups are suing, and a, we are all the boots on the ground. So if you have if you have stories, if you see things happening in your communities, um, in the abuse of immigrants, we, we ask that you call our hotline. Um, there's more information on the hotline and the table outside, but there's also opportunities to volunteer on, on the different campaigns and work that, that Flake does. Um, but uh, a, yeah, understanding that this this happens at a local level with families also being separated, connecting it to the broader context, um, and, and that this is going to take, uh, as I said once again, take all of us to like a, to be able to to address mass incarceration and mass detention of, of our community members and those that are um, the, uh, coming coming seeking a better life here. Thank you. I would say get the vote out. Right? Really get the vote out. Um, the conversations that need to take place, and I know Thanksgiving's over, but I think Christmas is coming, so the dinner table conversations with your um, relatives, with friends or, or family members. And we often, we tend to preach to the choir and talk to our, you know, people that we already know share our opinions. Um, go out and talk to people who don't share our opinions or, or, or the, you know, who don't have this information. And often, I mean, I find I find it amazing that you know, and I, because I'm, I'm an old white lady, so I talk to old white ladies, um, and and often they, they look at me like, no, 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 that's, that can't be right. And you know, and I'm like, no, yes, this is actually happening, and this is why it's happening, and this is why this language is being used, and this is why this senator is doing a listening tour. Uh, at the border, you know, promoting himself. Uh, and I don't know, I keep getting different, you know, is that canceled now, Senator Brewer's work uh, border? Yeah, after, after the last year, he didn't pass it this time, so we know that he's not okay. Okay, so anyway, you know when these events happen in your, in your um, community, and go witness, 
go to a judge, to go witness, stand out there with a sign and say, this is morally wrong. Or, you know, talk to people. And, and you know, it's, it's difficult to talk to people that you know are maybe going to give you blowback or are going to disagree with you. I know it's uncomfortable. And I think in this country we have this addiction to comfort. And we need to get out of our shells. We need to take this message out and make ourselves uncomfortable. Because this is what it's going to take to, to get this message out to as many people as possible. Absolutely. Josh? There are so many horrible things going on right now. And um, it, it's hard sometimes to, to zero in. But uh, I, I've zeroed in. And uh, the thing I'm thinking about is what's going on over the border. I visited uh, El Paso and Juarez, and I visited Toronto and Matamoros recently. And um, what I saw there was uh, horrendous. And if you come, what you see there is going to be horrendous. We're going to be demonstrating on the Brownsville side in front of the tent courts where the judges are on screens and the answer is always no. We're going to stand there and, and make ourselves heard there. We're going to work with the ACLU there. And then we're going to cross the bridge and we're going to see what goes on over there. And we're going to fuel our outrage. We're going to tell this country that not just that it's going on over there, but that we're the ones who are doing it. That we're the ones who are subjecting these people this way. And I want to say one more thing that I think um, I, it, it comes to me so often these days uh, that, that I have to say it whenever I see people. And, and that is that people of color here know this, but I want you to know that I know this. This is not about immigration. This is about white supremacy and racism. There would be no problem if a bunch of Norwegians were trying to get into this country. Um, it's, it's plain and simple, that kind of hatred. White supremacy, we, we, we hardly ever get this far. You know what white supremacy is, right? It's the idea that this thing called whiteness, this delusion called whiteness, entitles people with that delusion to the, the service of all other races and all other colors, that we are entitled to be served. Racism is the tool by which we beat people down and we separate wealth from an awful lot of the world and keep it for ourselves. The border is the means, one of the means by which we commit this atrocity. It's especially bad now. It's always been bad. It's especially bad right now at this moment. Come to the border and let's show people that we will not let it stand. That we cannot let it stand. We cannot let people live in squalor, subject to violence every night. We can't let it stand. Come down. January 12th, we're going to be in, in Brownsville. We're going to be standing there with signs, and then we're going to go over into Matamoros, and we're going to see what it is that we are doing. And we're going to make sure the world sees it too. Thank you. Absolutely. Vote, vote, vote. Vote for candidates that value human life so this does not continue to happen. And vote at the local level. That's very important. We're going to open it up to questions. We have the very handsome Alex in the audience. If you have a question, if, oh, if you could raise your hand. Yes? If you could introduce yourself and ask your question, please. Hello? Okay. Uh, I'm so glad to see you and I'm glad to see Josh. I was at Homestead and uh, I lived for 17 years on the border. I'm with the Border Patrol Victims Network. And um, I'm, it's amazing to see 
that uh, the things that we've known happen at the border for a long time. You know, we have the law 1070, which is what we are fighting now in Florida. We had it set up a long time ago. And uh, I think that uh, this movie and uh, what is happening now is bringing out finally what we have been seeing going on for many years. Right now, I'm going to say something, I'm going to ask a question. Um, right now, as uh, Josh knows, the Supreme Court of the United States is opening up the case of Celia Hernandez Huerica, who was shot in the back by the United States Border Patrol in 2012, in 2010. Then in 2012, Jose Antonio Elena Rodriguez was shot 10 times in the back by the United States Border Patrol in Nogales, Sonora. These kids were not trying to cross the border. He was walking to his home. Celia Dian was playing at, on, the, on the side of the wall, on the fence in Ciudad Juarez. Right now, the Supreme Court is going to decide whether or not the families of the kids killed on the Mexican side, if they will have the right to seek civil justice. There's been more than 106 people killed by the U.S. Border Patrol on both sides, mostly on the U.S. side, six on the Mexican side. Right now, if you are dying inside the United States, you have a right to see, to go for a civil trial. But if you die one meter on the Mexican side, you can't. And I hear what Josh is saying about standing and looking what is happening in Matamoros, and it's happening in the airport. Right now in Ojales, 5,000 people are right from Cuba, from Venezuela, and from Africa. There's people arriving from everywhere. So if, they, if we allow the United States court, the Supreme Court, to decide that no, they have no rights, is we are going to allow killing across the border. So I ask the people who are here in Tampa who can from 2 to 5 o'clock on, on Tuesday, we will be in front of the Border Patrol office, and we will be addressing this, and we are hoping to, to get enough action to, we just went to Washington with the father and the mother of Sergio and the father and the mother and the grandmother of Jose Antonio. We got a very short permit for the families to come. But I think it's very important as you guys are speaking and going around to remind people of this because it could happen in a few months or it could happen in January. And I'm very, very thankful for what you are doing and you have answered all of my questions as you spoke. And I'm just very grateful also for Aileen to make this possibility that we meet each other and we make community and we make this happen. The Border Patrol Victims Network has no office. We are all uh, volunteers and mostly members of families. Thank you very much. On Tuesday is going to be at the Ebor City Border Patrol Office, which is on 7 and 19 you know, right on the main street in Ebor City from 2 to 5. And you can look at our Facebook page, Border Patrol Victims Network. And in Noel Sonora, the family of Jose Antonio will be also doing a vigil on that day. And we will be in Matamoros. When you get to Matamoros, I hope you will meet the family of Guillermo Arevalo de Rosa, who was celebrating his birthday in Matamoros when he was border patrol, shot him in the heart. It was the birthday of his two daughters, and he died in the arms of his nine-year-old. That case didn't even go to court. So hopefully, Josh, I'm going to put you in touch with his wife, and you can bring that to others. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yes, I just yes, wanted sir. to make a point about the, the legal issues uh, because the legality and national security and all these these, these specters that are being invoked. Uh, for example, the, when when the, the ruling came down on the Muslim ban, they said, "Oh, national security. We don't want to take this tool of being able to exclude people from the country." They knew what was going on. They knew people were being excluded because of their religion. In his dissent, Justice Kennedy actually. Uh, made a reference to, gee, yeah, but we should also um, uh, be able to rely on the fact that our elected officials obey their oath of office. So, you know, everybody there knew what was, be what was going on, but national security is this magic word that is being thrown out whenever these cross-border issues are, you know, uh, come up. And there's actually uh, also now a growing trend to, um, to classify 
facilities, and I'm surprised they didn't do that actually when you were there, facilities as, um, what is it called, essential infrastructure, which then kicks up the, uh, the, the, the penalties for protesting there uh, into, into the felony category. People face, you know, these extraordinary um, jail sentences for being having interfered with essential infrastructure, which is intended to be airports and, you know, things like that, that are actually essential infrastructure, not pipelines that are going across indigenous lands that, you know, when they're now basically trying to intimidate protesters uh, from um, from being able to, from engaging in lawful protests because all of a sudden the consequences are basically you're ruining your life. You're not just getting arrested and, and paying a fine or, or, or you know, escalating your case to the next level. You're basically looking at spending 10 years of your life in jail for protesting. So these things are going on, they're trends, and this is all supported by the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, which is a, an organization that I think is a cancer in this country because it funds these uh, hate campaigns, the, the, the language, and they're funding these, these uh, neuro-linguistic programming efforts that basically gets the, the general population to associate immigrants with criminals and terrorism and all this national security. And as we all know, Americans are you know, maybe working two jobs, they don't have $500 you know, to, to change a tire on their car, if you know, not, not all of them, but you know, a much too great percentage of Americans are basically too exhausted to even think about these things when they plop up in front of the couch at night after they've you know, done homework with the kids and try to pay the bills and all this, that, that they're not differentiating between what's, you know, what's being said to them on the, you know, full news channel and, and, and the truth. So, you know, so this this is something that I think is, is going to be something we're going to face increasingly, is, is criminalization of, of protests, and at the end of the day, um, we're going to probably need mass civil disobedience, um, and they're really, really good. Thank you. Do we have another question? Hi, I'm Jesse from Tampa, and um, as a child I grew up on the west side of the airport, and back in the day, um, I, our neighborhood had a lot of Cuban families, and um, what they did was they um, cleared uh, trees and built houses and invited these families to settle in their country, because it's their country as well. So I grew up uh, in, with the diversity around me, and uh, I also had that in my family. My, um, uh, watching this film, and I think everybody out there is very attentive today, uh, watching this film, I lived in Homestead, and uh, it was before that big hurricane hit. Um, and I went to college in Roswell, New Mexico, and I lived in Albuquerque for a while. And I also visited Texas. So I'm thinking back, <laughs> I went to this film, and it brought back a lot of memories. There's a lot of, uh, I remember a Navajo family that in Albuquerque, there's a lot of Native Americans there, and um, a lot of Mexican and the only time before I ever had a passport, the only time I crossed the border was to go into Juarez for lunch. We parked our car, me and a friend, walked over the border, had lunch, and walked back. And I go, that's the first time I left my country, you know, and I was like, I was a nervous wreck thinking, you know, it's like a big deal, but it was so simple. Yeah, and my question is, uh, let me practice that. <laughs> what is shocking to me is the for profit. That is the shocking thing. And being a Floridian, not everybody knows about this. And so you're like sitting at home watching the news and you're thinking, oh, we're being invaded, like they try to portray the sphere. And uh, no, the, the for profit is very shocking. So that's basically at the core of what I see, and we do have to do something about it. Yes. My name is Wendy. Muchas gracias. Un nombre está Julio. My name is Wendy. 
in the West. It is from Honduras. She was in the McAllen detention center. Thank you for Gracias a usted, muchas gracias a usted. Y nosotros seguimos la batalla. Esto no para aquí. Gracias a usted.
But, oh sorry, we have one announcement and then it's 12.45. So I'm really sorry everybody, I have to keep us on time and also we can continue outside but they have to finish up here. So we have one announcement here, I know we had um, Linda wanted to say something and then we have, um, Linda did you want to say something, another Linda? She'll ask Josh later. Okay, so let's go real quickly over here. Yes, but just to announce um, that every Tuesday at the Sam Gibbons Courthouse, one block over, 801 Florida Avenue, there are demonstrations every Tuesday at 1030. They call the senators, Rubio and Scott's office, and say we're down here, we have signs. It's not most often on immigration. If you can ever come or send someone, 1030 to every, to every Tuesday, at the Sam Gibbons Courthouse, 801 Florida Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to follow up on the theme of following the money and bringing up Mackenzie Consulting for which actually created a lot of these policies, the isolation policies and those type things. And we need to focus on that organization, which is completely immoral. And if you work for a company or an organization is using them as a consulting firm, you should bring up their history and what they've done to the children. Do we have another announcement, Elaine? I thought we had Linda. Um, Chloe, if you want to wrap up, because we'll be out. We can be in the lobby until one. I'm yes. sorry. Yes. So we, what I'd like to say to you is that this isn't the end. We really do want to um, continue this conversation, maybe by creating a Hillsborough County or a regional immigration coalition to support FLIC and CARE and all of our organizations to keep doing this. But I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much for attending because we are on a tight crunch. Thank you to each of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you for your time.